There's one more thing I want to discuss. Until now, we took it for granted that diploid organisms underwent meiosis. That was fundamental to Mendelian genetics. But all aspects of life require explanation. And what I want to show you now is that so many aspects of sexuality have such clear adaptive value. The first thing I want to show you is the timing and direction of sex changes and also mechanisms for sex determination. Now, not all species are neatly divided into male and female. Some organisms, like this blue hamlet, are called simultaneous hermaphrodites. And each individual produces both sperm and eggs. So these two will take turns fertilizing each other's eggs. But with this fish, the blue wrasse, these are called sequential hermaphrodites. What you have here is an individual is born one sex, spends its early life as a member of that sex, and then it changes and becomes the opposite sex. So a sequential hermaphrodite, each individual produces sperm and eggs at different times in its life. Now let's look at these blue-headed wrasse because they're an incredibly interesting organism. What we have is a species where every individual is born a female. Everyone is a female, and then as they grow up, as they get bigger and bigger, they suddenly reach a point where they change and become a male. So this female blue-headed wrasse is young, and this male was a female until it grew up large enough, and then it turns into a male. So how can we get this sort of sex change? Well, the first thing to keep in mind is that if we look at size here, what we'll find is that for males, if you are a big male and you're competing against other males for access to matings, size is a real advantage. You can beat up on the little guys as long as you're a lot bigger than them. So as a function of size, your reproduction is far greater once you're big. And when you're a small little fish, it's not a very good idea to try to even behave like a male, okay? Females, on the other hand, have fairly comparable reproductive rates, whether they're small or they're large. Now, in fish and a lot of other organisms, size is actually a function of age. So what happens is that you're growing constantly through life, whether you're a male or a female, and what you should do is, if you are just freshly out of, the, out of the shoots there and you're ready to start reproducing, if you're still small, the best thing you could do is to reproduce as a female because for that size or that age, the best reproductive rate you're going to get is through laying eggs. But as you get bigger, you reach a point where now you could start competing against other big individuals for access to all those females and to mate with them. And so once you reach a certain age or size, then the best thing you could do would be to be a male. Now, these fish have very simple genitalia, and they uh, spawn externally, so it's not a big deal to convert their egg production system over to a sperm production system. So it actually makes a lot of sense that for an individual fish, it can maximize its lifetime reproduction by starting out as a female, staying a female until it reaches the size where now it could compete for access to other females and now become a, an aggressive male. And instead of producing eggs, starting to produce sperm. Now, not all species with sex change show this particular pattern. In shrimp, it's quite striking that females benefit more from being large in that they can produce a lot more eggs. This is a monogamous species, and so the male, if he's married to a big female, he can have pretty good reproduction, and he should go ahead and remain a male. And since they're not competing heavily against other males, it doesn't matter if they're small. All they need to do is find a mate, 
stay with her. And so male reproduction doesn't change much with size, but for the female, she can gain a much bigger reward by being a female once she's big and old. So in this case, the shrimp should all be born male, and then as they reach a larger size, turn into females. So now let's look at how sex is determined within different species. We've taken it for granted that there's a Y chromosome and an X chromosome. An XX produces a female in humans, and an XY produces a male. Well, that is the mammalian norm, and that's also found in a number of different insect species, and even in a few plants. But birds and strange plants like strawberries have a different sex determination system, where there's a so-called Z chromosome and a W chromosome. The female has one Z and a W, and the male has two Z chromosomes. And then there's some more insects where the females are diploid, they're XX, just like female mammals, but the males lack a, a, a second chromosome at the X chromosome, so they just have a single X chromosome. And then it gets weirder still. There are some organisms, like aphids, but also all the wasps and bees and ants, are called haplodiploid. The diploid is the female, and a male is actually an unfertilized egg. He's just a haploid. And then there's a number of fish and reptiles that have sex determination that's based on temperature when they're growing up. This is environmental sex determination. So in some species, if you're relatively warm during early development, then you grow up to be a female. Relatively cool, you're a male, and vice versa. Now, when we see things like strawberries, insects, and mammals having an XY versus XX sex determination system, and we see lots of different kinds of fish and reptiles who have environmental sex determination system, we suspect that this could be some sort of convergent evolution, that evolutionary pressure has selected rather deeply in evolution for a certain way to produce sons as opposed to daughters. We are sure that there are a lot of different species that are going to be subject to the same evolutionary pressures. And so this is a field where we do expect to see a certain amount of convergence. And it's because that trait is an adaptation to the circumstances peculiar to each different species. So let's look at a particular kind of sex determination system where we'll look at this haplodiploidy very briefly today. I will come back to it again in the next lecture. Haplodiploid, that's the bees, that's the wasps, that's the ants. You have a queen, she's diploid. If she has an egg and she lays it, but she didn't fertilize it, then it'll grow up to be a son. If she fertilizes her egg, the offspring will be diploid just like she is. It will also be a female. And so haplodiploidy is so persistent in these groups of wasps, ants, and bees that it's pretty clearly an adaptation of some sort. And we don't have time to do that today, but in the next lecture we will look at how the mothers, if they have an haploid diploid sex determination system, can use that to their advantage, that is the queen, because only her daughters are workers. And so if she needs more workers, she can fertilize her eggs and they'll grow up to be female. If she's ready to maybe have offspring that go off and start a new colony somewhere and she wants sons, then she lays unfertilized eggs. So it's under the control of the queen. And haplodiploidy also has a peculiar effect on the genetic relationships between social insect society within individuals within the hive. And we'll come back again to that in the next lecture. So haploidiploidy is an adaptation in social insects that allows the queen to control many aspects of the hive. But there's one other form of sex determination I want to show you, and that's called environmental sex determination. And this is based on temperature. 
When we talk about environmental sex determination, the usual factor with the greatest impact on whether an offspring develops into a male or female is temperature during incubation. So let's take for an example logger-headed turtles. The turtles live at sea most of the year, but the female comes up on land and lays her eggs in the beach. Now, whether her eggs grow up to be males or females depends on temperature. And if she lays her eggs in a cool part of the beach, or it happened to be a cooler year, then her eggs are all going to hatch into males. On the other hand, if she lays her eggs in a warm part of the beach, a sunnier spot, or during a warmer year, all of her offspring are going to grow up to be females. So what's the logic of this? Well, it turns out in loggerheads that female fitness depends more on temperature than does the male. And so females that are incubated at different temperatures will show a huge advantage if they had a high temperature during the incubation. Males are less sensitive to temperature than are the females. And so what we'd expect is that any trait in a population that allows the developing embryonic loggerhead to say, oh, it's warmer than average, then the best thing I can be is a female. If it's cooler than average, well, the best thing I can do is be a male. So we would allow temperature to determine which gender will be as we grow up. Now, not all species show this pattern of warmer temperatures developing into females. In crocodiles and alligators, it's just the opposite. So that females are in cooler areas and years. And in warmer areas of the beach, the nesting area, or in warmer years, those eggs are going to grow up to be males. So here, it's just the opposite. Now the male is more sensitive to temperature, whereas the female is relatively insensitive to temperature. So again, if we have a trait, I can detect the temperature, and if it's a cooler than average year, I should be a female. If it's a warmer than average year, boy, I could really benefit from being a male. I could go and dominate all the other males in the population when I grow up. And so that trait is favored where temperature can reliably predict your lifetime reproductive success during incubation. So I've summarized for you a couple of examples where sexuality in terms of the pattern of sex change or even which sex you grow up to be from an egg are determined by environmental factors. These all clearly have strong individual advantages. Those individual fish that are able to change sex so they can be female when they're young and turn into a male when they're big and able to dominate competitors, that will be a strongly favored trait, as is the trait of knowing that, well, if this is a certain temperature, I would benefit more by being a male and then becoming a male. This all then leaves us now ready to ask that big question of the day, well, okay, fine. There are advantages to being a male or a female in certain circumstances. But now let's ask, what are the individual advantages from engaging in sex itself?